All right, welcome everyone to Archive Dives with Oxen AI. This is a weekly series where we dive into interesting research papers in machine learning and AI and try to tease out their key insights so that you can apply them in your own work, whatever that may be. Um, if you're new here, welcome. We do this live every Friday with the Oxen AI community. And then we also post the, the videos on YouTube later for anyone who isn't able to attend synchronously. Just a little bit of background on us. Oxen AI is building a tool chain to help you collaborate and iterate on machine learning data sets, just like the ones used in these papers we discussed. So we're putting together basically like a, a Git and GitHub like collaboration experience, but optimized for storing million row CSVs and millions of multimodal training examples in the same data repository, whether they're audio, imagery, or in today's case, uh, generated video. So today we're going to go over Google's Lumiere, which is a recent video generation model that uses a novel temporal downsampling mechanism uh, to produce videos that are much more realistic and with much more kind of stable and naturally consistent motion um, than some of its predecessors. So these sessions are live and open to anyone. So if you want to join, please go to oxen.ai slash community, um, where you'll find links to our Discord, where you can join the community, as well as the video recordings and articles um, for our customers. So I will be sharing a Notion page as we go along. And if you have any questions, feel free to jump in uh, or throw them in the chat and Greg can kind of surface them during the call. As I said, we're going over Lumiere, which is subtitled a space-time diffusion model for video generation. And it's from a bunch of people um, across the teams at Google Research, the Wiseman Institute, Tel Aviv University, and Technion. And looking a little bit about the domain in which this paper sits, I already spoiled a little bit, uh, it is in generative video. And the authors kind of open by talking about how they feel, and, and I would agree, that video generation has lagged a little bit behind the really remarkable advances that we've seen in generative language modeling, as well as generative uh, image generation over the past few years. And they believe that this is primarily because it is really, really difficult uh, to you know, model natural motion over time uh, for a variety of reasons. One of the ones that they give is that we as humans are super well-tuned to patterns of natural motion um, and very small irregularities can kind of seem freaky to us and push us into that uncanny valley where, you know, the Will Smith eating pasta video comes to mind as an extreme example. Um, things are not moving the way that we are used to seeing them moving. So we kind of have a high bar um, for what constitutes natural looking motion uh, as people. And kind of going along with this, we have issues with compute costs and data availability that are kind of much steeper for um, video than they are for imagery, just because you can think of a video as being, well, it is composed of a bunch of smaller you know, images. So if you think of the kind of compute costs, the data storage costs, the memory cost of, of obtaining and annotating and generating uh, you know, a million five second videos at 30 frames per second versus a million images, uh, there's some pretty obvious differences there. So the authors are really primarily focused on tackling this problem of you know, smooth, natural, periodized motion. And just kind of from the jump, they show a really nice uh, example of how Lumiere is able to improve upon this. Basically, they're tracking key points in a couple of generated videos with their model on the right. Uh, some of the kind of previous models on the left. Um, and you can see that there's a much smoother, natural, more periodized pattern um, in Lumiere's model than some of the choppier things that are coming out of image and video, which was basically a, a primary predecessor here. And then for a little bit more, you know, qualitative of a demonstration, um, I'm going to go over, oh no, I guess this video got deleted since I <laughs> put it up a couple hours ago. Um, but it was the pepperoni hub, uh, hug spot video, um, which... I don't know if you've seen. OK, we'll find it. OK. Um, and basically, this is kind of an older uh, image generation video uh, that shows a lot of the, the issues with um, natural motion in these video cases. You can see that things are just kind of oscillating, especially when it comes to humans trying to move their mouths or trying to interact with things with their limbs. Um, and the motion is not consistent and certainly a little bit freaky. Um, if we compare that to the Lumiere generated video examples, you can already start to see a pretty big difference in the stability and the coherence, especially of things like moving their legs, the kind of natural you know, physics of dripping chocolate fudge onto ice cream. Um, so we're going to talk about what they were able to do to, to accomplish that and what architectural decisions they made to get us here. Cool. So 
looking into what was kind of the state of the art before Lumiere to see how they're improving on it. We're going to talk a lot when we talk about Lumiere about how they've simplified the generation of a video into one forward pass through a model. Um, and that kind of implies that before this, there was a two-step design to generating an output video. The first step is their generative model, which you can think of basically like as a, as a video-oriented extension. So the base generative model is generating um, not an entire video in the forward pass, but is instead generating specific timestamps that they call keyframes that they will then basically fill in the blanks of later. So these models, instead of if you're looking to generate a five second video at 16 frames per second, you need to generate 80 sequential frames. Um, these approaches would instead generate stills at various timestamps. So, you know, T equals one, T equals six, all the way up, you know, every five or every 10 up until T equals 80. And then they would come in with a second step called a temporal super resolution model. They would take these chunks that have been generated and they would basically fill in the blanks. So you would come through with your temporal super resolver. You have frames one through six and you would pass those into this model and have that model, you know, create uh, frames two through five and seven through ten for you. This super resolution approach is basically an equivalent in time um, to doing the kind of classic zoom and enhance sort of thing um, in in uh, on like imagery. So this is kind of upsampling spatially, which we'll also hear in this paper in width and height. And this is kind of an analog to that that's happening temporally. So instead of going, for example, from a you know resolution of an image of 128 by 128 to 1024 by 1024, uh, uh, temporal super resolution can take an image from three frames per second up to 16 frames per second. And that's what these existing predecessor models did. After is that, Ben, I have, a, I have a question. Is that like they take a really high frame rate video and to train it, they drop the frames in between and try to predict the frames in between? Correct. So that's actually just about to come up as one of the problems with it is, yes, this is a model that's like not in this generative pipeline. It's one where they've taken videos, they have sliced out, you know, a frame one, frame five, frame 10, frame 15. And then the kind of objective for training those models is to fill in the blanks. And, you know, in that case, they have kind of a ground truth. And we'll talk in, in just a second about where that falls apart a little bit for this use case. Uh, so this is great for memory efficiency, because instead of having to operate on a sequence of length 80, we're now operating on a sequence of length maybe 10 or, or 15 um, in the generative step of the model. But it does have some problems as well. Um, it's not really great for coherent motion. The first problem is that you know if you're generating these frames that are relatively far apart, fast motion like, I don't know, a, a hummingbird flapping its wings or like a, a ball being thrown quickly across a room are difficult to kind of naturally interpolate. Um, I have a little bit of an extreme example, which is, you know, if you're really, really chopping this up at a fine angle and you have a boomerang in your hand and you get frame one and that's the boomerang in the hand, frame 36, the boomerang is still in the hand. We don't know if, you know, they just juggled around in their hand in the meantime, if they threw it far away and it came back to them or what flight path it took. It becomes difficult to kind of understand the natural causation in that movement. The second big issue is that those temporal super resolvers don't have global context. So they are just operating on, you know, filling in those blanks between one and five, and then between six and 10, and then between 11 and 15. And they will tend to do so slightly differently. And no one in the modeling architecture is aware at that final step of the full context of the model, where things are going to go later in the model, which can lead to kind of sharp jumps and like weird evolutionary movements of Will Smith's face, uh, for example, over time. And the third big issue is what Greg was just talking about, which is a domain gap. So these models are trained on real imagery. They take real imagery, they drop out the frames, and then they're asked to resample them. There's a correct answer there. And this is imagery that you know was used in real life. We're now taking that same model and having it predict, you know, instead of real imagery, an imperfect generated generated image process. Um, so this can lead to what the authors refer to as an amplification of errors. If your generator is a little bit bad, um, the temporal super resolver might be faced with a point where it has to animate between two very weird states that are like not, you know, naturally, they should not naturally be, you know, achievable from each other in a short amount of time. So these are kind of the three, the three horsemen, I guess, that they characterize as what the problem is with this two-step approach and what they're hoping to, to fix with it. Any questions on what people did beforehand before we kind of step into Lumiere's solution? And beforehand, um, you said it was kind of a sequential generation and now they're doing it all in one 
go? Is it like a recurrent neural network or is it just a big comb net that they're conditioning with the previous frame or? Yeah, so they're actually taking a, they're taking like a, a text to image architecture, like like a stable diffusion or in this case, an image gen. Or are you, sorry, are you talking about Lumiere or the before case? Before case where you said they were generating yeah. like frame by frame. Yeah, so both of both of the both kind of the before and the after are um, existing text to image models that have then been like inflated, they say, to be able to handle multiple uh, frames and kind of convolving through the temporal dimension as well. Um, and then the chief contribution of Lumiere is that they make that a lot more uh, computationally tractable by reducing the kind of temporal depth that you actually have to go through so that you can start to bring in attention. Um, you know, down in that low temporal space, which is a little bit of a spoiler, but we'll, we'll get into it. Uh, I see. So they're neither a recurrent or a conditional, right. like conditioned on the previous frame. They just encode the frames in right. the network itself. Yep. Cool. They're added, basically taking something like stable diffusion, um, which is like width by height by channels, and then adding an additional dimension of, you know, your 80 frames or whatever uh, for Lumiere. Nice. And is it correct to, to say that the problem, the big picture problem before is just there's not enough clues to when you're when you're doing the averaging to to connect one image to another in the video there's just not enough there's too much time between each each sample is that kind of the big picture totally yeah that's kind of the first one here that the authors pointed out um oh gosh sorry i just scrolled down um this is the first one here that they you know there's there are kind of aliasing artifacts that can happen because there's just yeah. too much time occurring between those and the reason that that's happening kind of the cause behind the cause is that it's you know they would want to do it you know they, they would want to generate all of the frames but it before lumiere was just a little bit too uh computationally intensive to be able to do that uh, especially with memory requirements for generating yeah. okay. 80 frames at a time okay thank you absolutely okay on to Lumiere's solution. So as I said before, and as we kind of just talked about, Lumiere is going to move from that two-step approach to a one-step approach, and we're going to generate all 80 of the frames in one pass uh, without re relying kind of on doing that temporal super resolution step after the fact. And the way that they accomplish this, obviously they have to kind of beat that memory and compute limitation that we were just talking about, is through a new architecture called a space-time unit or a stew net. This is what they use for their single pass uh, generation without kind of relying on that keyframe based approach. And we said, yay, lovely, this is magically capable of overcoming the memory and compute limitations, but we didn't really talk about how. And the how here is that temporal downsampling that I was just starting to talk about with Greg. So I'll paste in um, just kind of the overall architecture of the StuNet. And you can see from the legend that these kind of green arrows represent a reduction in the dimensionality of the kind of temporal dimension that we talked about them adding to this model. You start with 80 frames, and as you go through the model, you reduce it into a Latin space that is smaller in width and smaller in height and smaller in time. We'll talk about what specifically they, they do to kind of um, convolve through those sequences and run attention mechanisms on those sequences. But the kind of key thing to take away here is if you look at that orange block, um, that is the expensive step of all of this process, right? The attention with quadratic scaling where every frame has to attend to every other frame. Uh, that is, you know, the most expensive step. And they've put that at the cheapest place that you can possibly do it. They've really strongly downsampled in both width and height, but also in time. And as such, through that downsampling in time, they're able to, uh, they're able to run these more expensive attention calculations down there. So hey Ben, I have another question in the chat. Yep. Um, so what are, what are like the training data pairs for this? It's texts and videos. Yeah. And then, uh, so the question in the chat was, is, was there anything about adding other subjects to the video, um, instead of trying to just generate pixels directly, like it, for example, giving human posture data, or I could imagine even giving like some other clues besides the text. This was just purely text, right? Yes. No, there, yeah, there was no augmentation in terms of, um, they don't like release the actual data set that they trained on, but they kind of evaluate on data sets that are just text and video pairs. And there's, there's no indication. I know there's been a little bit of buzz with like Laura or Sora, for example, about adding in like supplementary, you know, um, models and postures and things like that. And they didn't mention any of that in the paper. Cool. Makes sense. And scroll, could you scroll up back to that picture? So it, you see where the, the downsampling is occurring. Would you would you say 
it's correct to think of that like um, max pooling. And you know how in a CNN, in the first layer, you look, the filters are applied and it finds the big edges. And then the, the CNN layers go through max pooling after that to do the downsampling to, to get the whole spatial invariance across the, is, is that what this is doing? Yeah, so I'm not sure like how much of it is is actually a literal pooling op, uh, operation versus how much is just actually like even with a 2D convolution, if you use a filter size of three, you still are like losing kind of the outer ring there. So you're still kind yeah. of reducing that dimensionality. But given that, and they didn't really, really talk uh, into the very specifics of the architecture because the actual architectural steps for the spatial downsampling were just borrowed from Imogen, which is their base diffusion model that they used, right? Um, so I believe, you know, based on these over twos here and over four that were kind of cutting dimensions in half, that does scream max pooling to me. Um, but they didn't really get into those, those specifics. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. And we're going to, I saw your message in the discord too. We're going to go over this in a little more, a little more depth later on too. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so one thing kind of concept that I wanted to grab on our way through this is around diffusion probabilistic models, because I've been talking about this Imogen uh, model that's kind of the base of all of this, and uh, not really talking about what that is. So Imogen and stable diffusion are kind of different variants of diffusion probabilistic models that generate imagery um, through kind of using in their training data what's called a diffusion process. A diffusion process is when you add noise to an image, um, like we're seeing down here, and then you train a, a UNet architecture to kind of remove some of that noise and try to recover the signal from the original image. If you do this for long enough, you eventually get a model that you can pass in random noise to, and it will just generate a lovely image for you. Um, obviously, that is not a particularly useful training objective. Like we want to be able to um, condition it and we want to be able to kind of direct that. So again, this is covered in a previous excuse me, dive that we did on stable diffusion as well. But their solution to this is basically to take in text, convert that text into embeddings and process that along with the random noise so that we can get kind of not just a coherent output, not just a visually, you know, um, coherent looking output, but also one that is conditioned on the text that is passed in. The main reason that I bring this up is when we talk about the inputs and outputs to Lumiere, I'm going to be talking a lot about like feeding in noise patches or feeding in a noisy video. Um, and that's like a little strange if you're not familiar with diffusion models. And that's just because the inputs to these diffusion models that we use to generate things from them are just random Gaussian noise, basically a TV static, um, if you were to look at it. So when we talk about feeding in an input video of 80 frames that are all just noise, that's why we're doing it here. Any questions on that before we move on? I liked I liked Giotti's question in the chat, Greg. What what does it mean by reducing the time dimension? I thought about yeah, that. Definitely. How do you articulate that? Sorry, I'm looking for it. Yeah, so I would articulate it kind of like showing the uh, architecture diagram. So we said that we reduce the height and width. That makes sense to me. But like, what does it mean by reducing the time dimension? Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Totally. So the actual, and we'll talk about this a little more when we get into the, the architecture, we can kind of change up the order a little bit as well. The the actual operation that they're doing at this stage, so these these blue blocks downsample in the width and uh, height dimensions as we're used to, right, with various convolutional neural nets, but they also downsample in a time dimension. And the way that they do that is, let me see if I can pop ahead to um, one of the blocks that represents this. Okay, got it here. So they have, these are kind of the blocks that they add to their existing architecture. And they first, you know, there's kind of two ways that you could go with this. You could either have a convolution that operates on all three dimensions, like width, uh, height, and time at the same time, um, and reduces them all together. But they found that it was a little bit more expressive and consistent to first do a convolution over the width and height to reduce it. And then they do a convolution back. So you can basically think of uh, you know, for every pixel, you're looking at the pixels in that convolution, you're looking at the pixels all the way from the front to back of, of the kind of 80 frames that you start with, um, and applying a convolution filter to, to, to them in a way that kind of reduces that dimensionality. So we go from 80, essentially, to 40, right? Um, and we're kind of encoding information with those filters, and we go from 40 down to 20. So it's kind of hard to think about this in terms of what it actually means for the output. Like, I have a little note at the end on like, okay, how is this actually different than keyframes? Like we're still taking an 80 frame video and compressing it down to something that is less than 80 temporal steps. Um, but we can talk about that later as well. Did that answer your question? 
Uh, yeah, I have some more questions, but like I can wait for them. Yes, thank okay, you. Okay, perfect. Sweet. Yes. <laughs> All right. So just going over the actual um, kind of meat and potatoes of this, so to speak, uh, we're going to quickly look at the pipeline of Lumiere, just treating the Stunet kind of their primary innovation as a little bit of a black box. We'll look in at the Stunet, answer some more of those questions, and then talk about the kind of cool conditional generation stuff that they do um, if we have time. Mm -hmm. And of course, talk about their, their kind of eval metrics and, and how this model's doing compared to other things. So starting with the inference pipeline, the first step, like what we were just talking about with diffusion models, is to generate a vector of complete random noise. It's essentially a video of the exact dimensions that you want to get for your output. So here, they're generating 80 frames, 128 by 128 by 3 for R, G, and B. And it's all just completely randomly sampled uh, noise. One thing that you'll probably notice here is that the videos that we looked at on the Lumiere website are much higher quality than 128 by 128. They're actually 1024 by 1024. We'll address that in like step four of this process here, which will be the last step. But for now, you take this 128 by 128, uh, you know, by 80 by three. And again, that 80 is just the number of frames that you're looking to generate. And you pass it into the Stunet, which we're going to treat as a black box right now. You pass that into the Stunet, and what comes out is a video at that same resolution, 80 by 120, you know, you have all 80 frames, you have it in the exact size that it came in. And that's because for each of those temporal and spatial downsampling operations that's occurring, there's an equivalent temporal and spatial upsampling um, on the other end. And the kind of unit that's the backbone of this is great for, um, it's a fully convolutional network that's able to kind of maintain the size of the input as it passes through the network. So this is kind of already where we're starting to see the chief benefit of Lumiere. If we use some of its predecessor models, at this point, we would not have an output that's at our desired frame rate. At 16 frames per second, all generated with that full global context, we would get those keyframes, frame one, frame six, you know, frame 10 or whatever in RGB. But we still have one more thing that we need to resolve, which is that our generated video is in very low spatial resolution. So we do have an additional step here where we bring in some upsampling. And we talked earlier about the previous approaches using a TSR, a temporal spatial uh, temporal super resolver. We're now using an SSR, which is a spatial super resolver. Um, and just to bring this back, like this is quite literally the same kind of off the shelf technique that is used to like zoom and enhance uh, imagery like this. Sorry for using Jeff Hinton. It's the only compelling example I could find. Um, so there is a little bit of a catch with this though. Um, and this whole time when we've been talking about these long sequences of 80 frames, we've been talking about how computationally difficult in terms of compute and memory it is for these models to perform any of these operations, the generation, the upsampling on that whole sequence at a time. So what we're forced to do, which is a little reminiscent of the prior models, is to chop the video into smaller sections, upscale those smaller sections by themselves, and then stitch them back together. And you might say, wait a minute, that is sort of exposed to some of the same problems that the temporal super resolution had that we're trying to fix. And that is correct. So the authors made kind of their second key innovation here. It's a very interesting design decision that they made to, again, work on preserving natural motion. So um, previous approaches would upsample adjacent sections of the video. So they would say, OK, let's upsample frames 1 through 10. Then let's upsample frames 11 through 20. And then we'll stitch them together, add 21 through 30. And what these authors do instead is they actually sample overlapping segments. So I can show an example of this. They have basically two frames of overlap. The pre-Lumiere approaches, again, they're kind of completely adjacent segments. These ones, you can see they have the two frames of overlap there. But then that still raises the question of how we actually go about combining these together without introducing those same boundary artifacts that we talked about with the temporal super resolution issues earlier. Hey, Ben, real mm -hmm. quick. In that diagram there, are each one of the little circles a frame, and that's right. like a panda above it? Can yep. you zoom in a little bit? Yes. Anyway, so, um, got a good call out. Hold on. Okay. So as I zoom the uh, the image in <laughs> oh. itself back, so I'll try to do this. But yeah, each one of these gray dots is one of those eighty generated frames. Um, and so in the pre-Lumiere example, this is after that temporal super resolution step. So we do have 80 frames there, but you can see here, they're just taking frames. It looks like, you know, zero through eight and then nine through 18. Whereas here we're taking zero through, these should be drawn a little bit differently so that you can show that they're overlapping boxes, but this is not like a box of six and then a box of two and then a box of 
eight uh, box of six it's a box of eight overlapping another box of eight offset by two if that makes sense yeah totally so in theory that's going to generate we're going to have more compute right but they have Correct. some trick later okay yeah yeah so it will um and i think they kind of choose that smaller um, overlap size as a way to try and mitigate that just of, of only those two frames which is still not nothing but i think the result that they get from it is definitely worth it uh, and the technique that they use to do this uh, could be a whole different archive dive, and maybe it will be. And that technique is called multi-diffusion. And we don't have time to kind of jump into the full, you know, guts behind uh, how this actually works. But what I will do is kind of show an instructive example um, using imagery, and then we'll talk about how we can translate that from the spatial dimension over to the time dimension. So multi-diffusion is basically a technique that allows you to generate multiple different um, images through a diffusion process, but in a way that says, hey, these images are related to each other in space or in time in a specific way. So if you could only generate, let's say, a 1024 by 1024 square, but you wanted to generate a 1024 by four times that panorama, like the one that I just pasted in, if you just tried to do that as four separate squares with the same prompt, you'd have a bad time. You get something like this. There's no kind of seamless, you know, knitting together of, of these images across the borders. What multi-diffusion allows you to do is still generate those independently, but subject to a common constraint such that this is still four separate generations that are stitched together in a mechanism that we could talk about in a completely different time uh, by multi-diffusion such that they are kind of uh, you know, spatially consistent and don't have strange boundary artifacts on those edges. They're kind of part of a consistent panorama. So what the authors are doing here is basically doing that, but instead of working in the kind of X spatial plane to say this is to the left of this, which is to the left of this, they're doing that over time. So they're taking those generated, you know, one through 10 frames and then eight through 18 and using multi diffusion to stitch them together um, along the time axis instead of the horizontal space axis. So I have a picture of what this kind of looks like. This is kind of slightly confusing, but it's basically uh, just showing the evolution of the video over time. And you can see on the bottom, you are able to see those boundary artifacts where the various super resolved things were spliced together. It's like not consistent. Uh, whereas on top, you're able to see that the multi-diffusion is able to condition it to have really smooth transitions between them. Putting this all together, I've kind of annotated the core steps here. So we generated our random noise input video. We then passed it into the StuNet and got out a, you know, semi-magically, which we'll go into right after this, um, a video of the same size and shape, but it's actually a video now. It's not static. And then we used this multi-diffusion, uh, you know, SSR technique to take those videos from 128 by 128 and upscale them to 1024 by 1024 and stitch them together using those overlapping frames um, in a way that makes them look like one coherent video like we saw at the beginning. Do you have a, just like... TLDR on the multi diffusion thing? I don't have a great one. Like I, there's a lot of emphasis on kind of the spatial constraints. And if you go, I have a link actually, that's useful for further uh, exploration to the kind of living paper um, of it online. They show kind of how you can, at least in the space dimension, you know, have overlapping segments. They don't have to be right next to each other. You could, you know, cut various corners of an image and kind of pastiche them together. Um, but I would highly recommend uh, at least checking out the abstract just because it's it's a little bit to wrap your head around, but um, yeah. Great, thanks. I'll put that link in here. Okay, now last big conceptual thing before we get to see the fun stuff that it makes is talking about the actual architecture of the StuNet and what makes it special. So we have this from earlier. Um, and this is, again, that piece that we treated as this black box up here. It's the second step. And you might think, okay, well, a video is a collection of images. So can you just use, and we were talking about this at the beginning, can you just use for a, a video generation algorithm, an image generation model, and then tweak the dimensions of it and add some additional layers such that it's able to process that temporal dimension? And in this case, the answer is yes. Um, so the authors start with Imogen, which is a text to image diffusion architecture like we talked about earlier. They've stated that they could also use stable diffusion here, which is a little bit more um, common one, but operates in a slightly different way, um, at least somewhat you know, ambivalent to the actual base model that they're using. 
Um, but this is obviously a model that's designed to produce one image, and we need to scale it up to produce a sequence of related images through time, uh, like we need to do for video. Um, so this process is called inflation. And there's a couple of things that need to happen here. Obviously, we're adding a whole additional dimension, right? We're going from height and width and the number of channels, red, green, and blue, to height and width and the number of channels and the number of frames. Um, so there's architectural kind of changes that need to be made to the input and the various shapes of the layers. Um, but they are able to kind of keep the weights from that pre-trained text to image model frozen. So they have to add various layers to handle the kind of, you know, now four dimensional nature of all of this, but they are able to kind of use the base text and image model and just fine tune the layers that they've added. We'll talk about the layers that they add in a second. So they add two types of blocks um, in their kind of inflation step. And this is what kind of handles the temporal magic. The first is the convolutional um, down and up sampling block. So this is what we talked about earlier, where after the existing operations that happen in this underlying image net model, or sorry, not image net, image n model, um, they do an additional two-dimensional convolution over the width and height of the image um, to extract some more information, introduce some more nonlinearity there while doing a little bit of additional downsampling. And then they convolve through time, uh, which is whoa, uh, but through, you know, kind of back to front, the various um, time steps in the model. That's this one-dimensional contribution or convolution. They did some ablation studies where they looked at just um, doing all three of those at the same time. So performing a 3D convolution through height and width and time um, and found that not to be as good as kind of handling them separately. So I think of this 1D convolution step as, you know, it does perform the actual temporal downsampling, maybe going from 80 frames to 40, but it also kind of serves to reduce that temporal information um, in a way that is more, more preserving of the underlying signal than just generating chopping out random frames into a lower dimensional space so that it can be operated on by the attention mechanism, which we'll talk about in a second. Cool. The other big addition that they make is an attention block. And this also facilitates the kind of integration of that temporal information over time. But as we've talked about, um, attention calculations are very expensive um, in memory and compute. And they kind of tend to scale quadratically because of the need for um, you know, each token in a sequence, or in this case, each frame in a sequence to attend to all of the other frames. So that's kind of the core magic of this. If you look back up at the architecture diagram here, you can see that this orange or I guess slightly yellow um, inflation block or the, the attention-based inflation block only happens at the point in the network where the data has been reduced the most sharply. So if we tried to do an attention block up here where we still have T over two, or you know up here where we still have all 80 of our frames, this would be completely computationally infeasible. This is basically why this was, you know, this one pass generation was thought to be infeasible before, but by first reducing the kind of size of the sequence by the time we get to there, these authors are able to kind of operate um, and, and sort of use that attention mechanism without making it completely computationally intractable. And as you see, again, I'm not completely sure if these numbers that they're using in terms of their parameter count reductions from or, or their size reductions from like T to T over two and then T over four are like literal or if they're kind of just meant to demonstrate. Um, but if we do take them, take them as truth here, then they're reducing the sequence length that the attention has to operate on by a factor of four, you know, from 80 down to, to 20 frames, essentially. Um, and that kind of correspondingly reduces the compute and memory requirements by a factor of 16. So that's obviously a huge deal. And they're able to, you know, really run kind of sequence or sequential um, attention operations on this really reduced space and get a more temporally integrated cohesive output that they're then able to upsample and provide as a, as a generated video. I know that stuff was a lot. Um, we're going to move on to the cool stuff that they do with the model and then their evaluations and close out. But any questions on kind of the architecture uh, before we before we move on to that? Yeah, quick question. Did they do any studies on the effect of output quality and compute costs on the number of kind of downsampling, either like spatially or temporally? Yeah, I didn't see anything like that, but I was thinking of it because it does appear, you know, when you think about the five second, um, the five second image or videos that are able to come out of this, and then now we have a minute videos with similarly stable motion coming out of Sora. I know that a lot of their findings were heavily reliant on like, just keep, just keep scaling it. Um, but no, I didn't see anything around looking at, okay, what if we, you know, temporarily downsample to, to, you know, a factor of four versus a factor of eight, um, but would love to see it. So as for what they're able to do with it, besides plain text conditioned image generation, um, they say that kind of another 
benefit of this model in practice is that since you don't have to worry about the two-step generate and then interpolate thing, you're able to do a lot of cool stuff with it easier since it's one model that just generates the whole video at exactly the frame rate that you need. So they do a bunch of different conditional generation tasks um, and they do them all within this really cool framework uh, that I liked a lot. And when you think of the input shape of the data that's going into this model, we said it's time by height, by width, by channels, noise. We're going to add two things to that um, for our conditioned generation. We're going to add an actual video, not a noise video, which we will call C, right? So this is a conditioning video. It's the same shape as the input video, but it has, you know, some specific style or flower or, you know, object or person that we want to impute into this video that we're generating. And then we're also going to add in a bit mask, ones or zeros, showing where we want to condition and where we want to not use that conditioning information and just animate whatever we want to animate. This will become really concrete in a second when we look at examples of it. But you basically take these and you concatenate them together and you have your three noise channels, your three channels of your conditioning video, which could be you know, a butterfly that you want to superimpose on the generated image. And then one bit mask channel, which basically says, here's where the butterfly that we want to superimpose on the image is in C. This becomes very neat uh, because you can do image to video tasks with this, which is pretty great. So in this case, your C, your conditioning video would be uh, an image of a B for the first frame and then kind of blankness after that, right? And then your M would be saying, okay, mask on the entire first frame. So for the very first frame, copy over this B and then it would be blank for the rest of the frame. So we're going to copy over the B as well as we can within this network. And then we're just going to let the B do its thing, uh, have the model just generate stuff for the B to do, uh, which is pretty fun. And I am going to switch over here because um, we've got some video recordings from Lumiere from the website, uh, and they are a little large, so I don't want to copy paste them in. You're able to see that with doing that, we can take that B's starting point um, and have it kind of run around and you know dig its hands and legs and stuff into the honey, which is very cool. Um, another core use case that they use is in painting. So instead now they're passing in kind of an incomplete video, a video that's been cropped out. Here we have half of a pizza and our, our kind of C video that we want to pass in is that half of the pizza with the missing top half. You can see the top half is just black. And then the mask would mask out the top half of the pizza. Say we want to keep in the bottom part and we want to fill in the top part. And what we're able to get out of it is, is really to me, I think the most impressive result that I've seen from Lumiere, which is this extremely coherent, like I could see this in an advertisement and would have no idea that it's generated kind of in painting of the proper placement of the basil and the kind of completing of the round shape of the pizza. Uh, I find this to be really awesome. And this technique can also be combined with a text prompt um, for conditional in painting. So you can see these, these uh, gray boxes here are representative of the mask that's being applied, that M that we've been talking about. If you place it on a specific portion and then condition it with text, say, I want to add a bathrobe to this specific mask, um, it can do that just fine. And it can add a, you know, a party hat to this, this chick and, and things like that, which is lovely. Um, the last one are cinemagraphs. And this is where we are wanting to animate only part of an image and leave everything else constant in the background. So I've seen, you know, taking a still image of a butterfly and having it fly around the still image, something like that. So your conditioning video in this case is a video of that still image. So 80 frames duplicated. So when you play it, it looks like it's not even a video. It looks like it's just an image. Your mask is then all ones for the first frame saying copy over this first frame. And then from there, it's only ones in the section of the video that you want to freeze. So you can see this mask here essentially says, for the very first frame, we want to set the scene by copying over this image. And then going forward, we only want to animate what's within that gray box. Um, the mask basically says, you know, fill this stuff in and keep the background constant. And what you're able to get is a nice animated fireplace while the background stays, you know, relatively consistent. Like Lumiere is not trying to insert people playing volleyball in the background, for example. Cool. Any questions on that conditional step before we talk a little bit about eval? Did they talk any about like the time complexity of generating these things? Um, they did not in a way that was like different from, you mean just like for any generation or for the conditional stuff specifically? Uh, any generation, but I was curious, like if they tried to integrate that conditional generation into runway ML and you click yeah. go, would it take like a minute or would it take instant? Yeah, I'm not actually sure. I, I wonder, I looked through the appendix. I don't think I saw anything about that, but I would definitely be interested. Yeah, cool. 
Cool. And then for eval, um, they did perform uh, a zero shot, you know, inference run on this data set called UCF 101, which like we talked about is a text and a data set of essentially text and video pairs, text describing what's in the video. And they have two, unfortunately, opposed in their direction of what is good metrics, the Frechet video distance and the inception score. So lower FVD is better, higher IS is better. Um, and I came on this table kind of expecting them to blow away the competition because this has been heralded as like a huge, you know, uh, accomplishment in video generation. Um, and these results are definitely competitive, uh, but they're not earth shattering at all. You can see they're not the, the leader, you know, of their contemporaries in either category here. And the authors do have a response to this. They think that this metric is a little bit flawed for what specifically they're trying to do for two reasons. And I find these really compelling. The first reason is that these metrics are oversensitive to low level details of the image and not sensitive to the kind of things that we actually care about in evaluating the realism of an image as like human observers, which is mostly that natural motion that they've been talking about this whole time. The second disadvantage is that these metrics only operate at 16 frames, which at their frame rate is one second of video. And the whole advantage of Lumiere is that it operates across, you know, a full five seconds globally, right? So these benchmarks to their estimation do not account for that level of global coherence. And to fix this, they also do a human study, kind of like almost like an RLHF style data collection process where for all of these alternative models, they show their kind of they show a, a random human participant uh, a video for the same prompt generated by image A and, or by model A and then generated by Lumiere, ask them which one they prefer, um, and they smoke the competition in these. This is where you really, this kind of human eval is where you really see dramatic differences in both the video quality and the alignment to the text prompts, which I thought was really, really interesting because you would think it's more focused on the video quality if we're looking at stabilizing motion globally across the duration of the video. Um, but there was also a, a pretty significant benefit to, to text alignment as well. Wrapping up here, um, in general, we tend to see, we saw it in stable diffusion. We've seen it throughout the entire history of, of deep learning that you know compressing computationally expensive things into Latin spaces to learn representations in a way that is more computationally feasible. Uh, good job. Keep doing that. Uh, and I think as I look at the the kind of human preference data here, that is very convincing. Like something about their technique is obviously working. Um, and Evan, I'll, I'll get to your question in just a second because I have actually one of my own. Um, when we think about this place in the network where we are compressing this down into this lower dimensional temporal relation space or, or, or uh, Latin space, like we are downsampling it temporally, right? Like aren't we kind of doing a little bit of a keyframing there? Like we're still in a position where like we were in the models that this is improving on, where we have a lower dimensional temporal representation than we want. And then we want to generate in the output. Now, I guess it's just like the, the fact that it's not just an image and an image and an image, but is instead a kind of compression down into a latent space that makes that more feasible. Um, but I was a little surprised that it works as well as it does because we're still kind of not ultimately generating like 80 frames with total, you know, coherence across them. We are sampling down into a much coarser temporal resolution. That is the feature of this, which is great. Um, but I was also just curious if anyone had any intuition on like why it's so much better to do it this way than explicitly through the keyframes approach um, outside of what they said in the paper, which I do find convincing. Um, and we'll kind of leave it there and, and get started there.